Coming up on DTNS, the Epic Apple case reaches the heart of the matter. Should you worry about that Wi-Fi vulnerability you may have heard about and Venus flytraps become soft robots? This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, May 12th, 2021 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. We were just talking about inner traffic, internet traffic, uh, super glue in your fingers, and so much more on Good Day Internet. Get that wider show. Become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. GitHub added support for physical security keys when using Git over SSH, which lets developers send push, fetch, and pull requests remotely. GitHub previously allowed passwords, personal access tokens, or an SSH key to access Git, o Git over SSH, but does plan to remove support for passwords later this year, citing their consistent source of account security challenges. Speaking of standards and connectivity, the Connectivity Standards Alliance, made up of hundreds of device manufacturers, including Apple, Amazon, Google, and Samsung, announced the Open Smart Home Standard Project Connected Home over IP, or CHIP, has been rebranded. So if you heard about CHIP, it's now called Matter Devices, with Matter, M-A-T-T-E-R, branding, uh, to go on sale by late 2021. I kind of liked CHIP better, but okay. Mm -hmm. Amazon updated the Echo Show 8, now with the same 13 megapixel sensor as the Show 10, and also the ability to digitally pan and zoom to follow users, support for AR features, and a new octa-core process for the same $130 price. The Echo Show 5 was also refreshed, now offering a 2 megapixel front camera for $85 and a kids edition available for $95. Also, different rear fabric and a two-year warranty. TCL's given out pricing information on the XL collection of its 85-inch TVs previously announced at CES. We were talking to Robert Heron yesterday. All the TVs are coming out now. The 4K 4 Series TV is currently on sale for $1,600, and the QLED 85R745 with full array local dimming and Dolby Vision HDR support is $3,000, shipping in the coming weeks. TCL also announced it will launch an 8K mini LED 85-inch TV later this year. They didn't give exact pricing or availability on that yet. In a blog post published Wednesday, security researcher Fabian Braunlein demonstrated how Apple's Find My network can be exploited to become a data transfer mechanism. By faking the way that an AirTag broadcasts its location as an encrypted message, that's the way it works, the hack lets packets of arbitrary data be transmitted over the Find My network, which is capable of using the data connection of any nearby Apple device that has Find My enabled. And Braunline's demo, short text strings are sent back over the Find My network to a home Mac, and it was successful, but it's not clear if this could be used maliciously. Yeah, it just seems like a way to send messages in a weird, weird, odd hack. So, so far, it just seems like a cool hack. Uh, but yeah. we'll keep an eye on it. Uh, this one is possibly used maliciously. Let's talk about the Wi-Fi frag attacks. Belgian security researcher Mati Vanhoff published details of the frag attacks, as they call them. The attacks take advantage of newly discovered vulnerabilities in the Wi-Fi standard. Now, they're newly discovered, but some of the vulnerabilities appear to have been there all the way back to 1997. Uh, there's also some common programming mistakes that Vanoff discovered in Wi-Fi products that can be taken advantage of. The vulnerabilities could be used to inject plain text frames or malicious code into a protected Wi-Fi network. So you've got it encrypted, but this is a way to sneak in. An attacker, however, must be within radio range of the network so they can connect. The user must have some fairly uncommon network settings. So most people wouldn't be vulnerable if they have the standard settings. And the user also has to be tricked into interacting with the attack. It requires you to fool the user. Vanoff disclosed the bugs to the Wi-Fi Alliance about nine months ago. Microsoft has addressed three of the 12 in Windows in the March 9th patch. Uh, a patch for the Linux kernel is in the release system, working its way through, and multiple router makers are developing patches as well. The Wi-Fi Alliance said there's no evidence these vulnerabilities have ever been used and the bugs can be avoided by following recommended security practices. Keep yourself from being tricked, for instance, uh, not using those network settings, for instance, as well as, quote, through routine device updates that enable detection of suspect transmissions. So there's a way to like catch them uh, if, if they're happening through, through some updates. So yes, patch, 
but no, don't freak out uh, because you're probably not vulnerable to this. So one of the first things I thought was the headline itself is one of those that seems like it'd be fun to freak out about something as old as 97 or issues going back to 97 uh, just makes for a fun conversation. But if anything, I'm glad to hear that something was at least so obscure or hard to find that it took this long for it to be detected. And now it's being fixed and talked about and people are updating. And I don't know, it's mostly a feel good story for me uh, in, a, in the in the security news. I, I, I kind of like this one. Yeah, dating back to 1997. I mean, <laughs> even saying Van Hoof disclosed the bugs to the Wi-Fi Alliance nine months ago, you go, okay, well, that was some time ago. We're just now hearing about it. But the fact that Wi-Fi standards constantly being upgraded over the years, uh, updated and upgraded, and and yet there are still vulnerabilities that have been there all along. Uh, yeah. It just took, you know, either, not that, Nobody else has ever known about them before, but uh, but surprisingly, it uh, you know this stuff was 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 new to to a lot of companies because they weren't taken advantage of in any meaningful way. Yeah, it's a good reminder how to think about security. Uh, security is a constant defense, uh, trying to minimize your risk as close to zero as possible, but you never get to zero. Uh, it's it's always a race and. When there is a vulnerability, it's tempting to think like, well, somebody should have caught that. But vulnerabilities are discovered by people trying to figure out how to break something. And you don't know they're going to exist until somebody's tried hard enough and been ingenious enough to figure it out. This this vulnerability could have been discovered in 1997, but the, I think the key point is no one ever did until Van Hoof did. Uh, and so it wasn't likely to be used. It's also uh, really difficult to implement uh, and and all of that. But this is a great story because it shows that like even something this obscure and hard to figure out is getting discovered by someone who wants to protect this before somebody yeah. who could have misused it. Yeah, what blows me here, away here. is my daughter was born that year and we still haven't found the proper patch for her. So wish us luck, everybody. Just kidding, she's great. <laughs> That sounds worse than I meant it. She's wonderful. Yeah. All right, moving yeah, on. Uh, hey, YouTube plans to launch a 100 million, with an M, fund to pay popular creators on its recently launched Shorts platform. This is sort of their TikTok slash uh, Reels competitor. In the coming months, with plans to fund uh, content through 2022, YouTube will reach out to creators who receive the most engagement and views to offer this funding. Uh, they do not need to be part of the YouTube Partners pram as its, uh, program as it's currently constituted. YouTube did not detail the amounts or the metrics or any of that. Uh, Snap and TikTok also have programs to pay creators to create content on their platforms. And on Alphabet's latest earnings call, uh, CEO Sundar Pichai said Shorts received 6.5 billion daily views globally, which is a lot, but it's also YouTube. And I don't think that's as much as they want yet, but this is a way to do it to start Paying out those top creators. I have a big question about this, though. If you are a top creator of short-form TikTok-style content, uh, chances are you're already doing that at TikTok. You're already doing that on Reels over on Instagram or anywhere else, Snap, for that matter. YouTube coming to you and saying, hey, come do that over here. They're not saying, or at least we don't think they're saying, come be a part of this exclusive, uh, exclusively. Just make sure your content is here and that it's driving numbers. And that's it. That's what it seems like. Yeah, because you're, you're not part of the partners program, which is where the exclusivity things are. I and mean, we don't know. They might be trying to make people do exclusives, but it doesn't say. And my guess is YouTube just wants to get that content over. And if it's popular enough on shorts, they don't care if it's also popular somewhere else. They're just going to keep feeding money to the stuff that people are watching the most on YouTube. Well, and the this whole one hundred million dollar fund, which is sure, like, well, that sounds like a lot. Okay, it's to popular creators through the end of next year. So it sounds mm. like YouTube is saying, let's make a real short bet here and kind of <laughs> see what's see where we are at the end of twenty twenty two. You know, are we paying a million dollars each to a hundred creators? It's probably more creators who are getting a lot less money from us. You know, and then at that point, then maybe we reassess who are the real stars. Then we talk exclusivity, you know, and reaching out on a more personal level. YouTube more to me is, I mean, YouTube has, is just, it's such a video behemoth and it's, it's so many different kinds of video. I mean, instead of 
I don't know what YouTube was in the very early days where people were just uploading whatever they had, you know, on a camera. It's, you know, it's longer form content, it's series, it's tutorials, it's, it's highly produced, you know, movies and documentaries. It's all of the things. Shorts has a place on YouTube, but YouTube is still trying to like figure out how to be the place where you want to see that kind of content because that's where TikTok is just reigning supreme and it's like a me too thing rather than a, Oh, YouTube's doing something different here. Yeah. And also there's this other side thing that I just remembered. Um, and this happened a lot with reels in the early days that's smoothed out a little bit for, for Instagram, but a lot of the content that was showing up on reels and currently on this new shorts program are repurposed TikTok videos often with the TikTok logo stamped right on the video, which they have built in when you export a video or download a video, people mm -hmm. are just repurposing a lot of content right now. And I, I would assume that would smooth out over time. And anybody they're going to pay, they're going to want to have raw, real, you know, not just a TikTok video re-uploaded to their service. But that's kind of what's happening right now. A lot of this stuff is just repurposed. I think, and I think I, you've, you've both changed my theory on this, and I think it will stick. I was thinking this is not going to work for YouTube, but W Scott is one uh, in uh, one of our mods and in our chat room says, I like shorts because I don't have to leave YouTube and go to another app to see this content. In my mind, it doesn't matter, but that's just me. And then something Sarah was saying about how that, you know, this is, this is content that is often reposted and people are fine with that. I think what's going to happen here is that yes, TikTok survives because it's an entire ecosystem, right? You're in TikTok to do TikTok and TikTok is great at showing you things. Snapchat the same way. I do my Snapchat things and I show me and show me Snapchat in context. And I don't think YouTube can beat them at that game. But I do think there are people who are like, yeah, I just don't want to use TikTok. I don't want to pick up Snapchat. Uh, but I do want to see some of those funny videos. Shorts may be good at that. It will never beat TikTok or Snapchat or even Reels, but it could just be a persistent window to feature that content to say like, Hey, if you want to see some of the funny stuff on TikTok without having to become a TikTok user, here it is. And that might be successful enough for YouTube, mm -hmm. uh, at which point I don't know that you need to pay people for that. I will say. Yeah. Well, a huge part of it will be, uh, um, the app experience on mobile. Um, because part of the reason TikTok is uh, outside the algorithm is a, is the app to beat at the moment is it's just flick, 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 bim, bam, boom, follow, yeah. don't follow, whatever. And in YouTube and Instagram, for that matter, you've got this issue of like, all right, where's the button for the, the reels and where's the rest of it? And they try to center it, so that's cool. That mobile experience is going to have a lot to say about how this sticks more than desktop. But I could see why if you're on desktop or, you know, a notebook or something, you just stay and watch them there. I yeah. get that. You're, <laughs> this is going to be a weird analogy, but your department store uh, restaurant is never going to drive out your favorite diner. Right? There you go. Yeah. Cuz it's good point. But it also <laughs> succeeds within the department store. That's Shorts is like the department store restaurant. <laughs> That's a really good comparison. I mean we, it's, it's we don't want to like put the creation of the content is the important part here and we all know that can be great and everything but that's a great analogy. Very nice. All right, Xiaomi and the U.S. Defense Department reached an agreement to remove Xiaomi from a list of firms barred from U.S. investment. The Defense Department put Xiaomi on the list back in November, identifying it as a communist Chinese military company. The listing would have led to Xiaomi being removed from U.S. stock exchanges and also global benchmark indexes. However, Xiaomi challenged the listing in court, and U.S. District Judge Randolph Contreras issued an initial injunction holding up implementation. A filing in U.S. court said the U.S. and Xiaomi have now agreed to resolve the issue without the need for litigation and will file a joint proposal with the court before May 20th. Earlier this week, the U.S. extended a 2019 executive order barring use of Huawei's networking equipment by U.S. companies. So, Xiaomi, Huawei, two <laughs> different stories for sure. Also Wednesday, the U.S. Senate's Commerce Committee will vote whether to send a bipartisan bill targeting Chinese tech to the floor. It would spend $100 billion on domestic research and development at U.S. colleges, universities, and regional tech hubs and increase sanctions on China. Yeah, so uh, this is the U.S. recalibrating. Uh, Xiaomi was an overreach, uh, and they they the new administration took time to evaluate that and has now decided, yeah, okay, I think we're cool 
taking Xiaomi off that list. Uh, but they're not taking a bunch of others off the list. You know, like you said, Huawei is not going anywhere. Uh, it's 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 staying on that list. So I don't think this is the U.S. letting up pressure on China in this way, uh, for good or ill. I do think this is the U.S. sort of uh, refocusing and saying, okay, what what do we really want to pursue here? Well, yeah, but also, I mean, I, I this is going to be misconstrued misconstrued to somehow a political approval, but. I like the idea that not all these companies are the same. Why would they be? It's it's easy to say, well, you know, one Chinese company in tech is like all Chinese companies. Well, in yeah, tech, even the previous administration did not ban every single Chinese company. Exactly. exactly. Yeah, right. yeah, that it's kind a case of case-by-case basis. Yeah, exactly. Discriminating, uh, you know, based on whatever the real reasons are seems like the right way to do it. So good on them, and maybe the others will see the light of day. I don't know. Maybe not. Some of them are kind yeah. of egregious. It'll be hard to, but. Yeah. And, the, and the other side of this, if you were an investor in Xiaomi or a customer of Xiaomi and you were worried because you were worried about, you know, this entity list not making it through court or, or whatever, uh, that goes away. There's there's now probably not going to be a court case. We'll find out for sure May 20th when the settlement is put before the judge. But it sounds like they're going to resolve that. Hey, folks, if you need a little more explanation on big tech topics uh, like 5G or latency and bandwidth, uh, or this week we've got an episode about Wi-Fi 6 coming to our related show, Know a Little More. Uh, if you'd like to know a little more about Wi-Fi 6 and a bunch of other things, go subscribe at knowalittlemore.com. <laughs> Let's check in on the Epic versus Apple trial. For the past two days, Epic has been making their central case that Apple is a monopoly because it costs money and it's difficult to switch to another platform. Essentially, what Epic's trying to show is that lock-in and a lack of substitutions, in other words, things that are easily swapped out, make Apple a monopoly. Epic also tried to argue that Apple has an aftermarket monopoly in in-app payments. Epic's expert witness was the chairman of the global economics group, David Evans. There's a good breakdown of his testimony on protocol from Ben Brody, if you want more on that. Here's essentially what Evans argued, though. Apple is a monopoly over the market of getting apps to iOS users. That's what Epic is trying to get convince the judge. So, yes, it is a monopoly because iOS users are locked in. It's a separate market from Android because of the difficulty and the cost of switching phones. Evans showed data that when Fortnite was removed from the iOS app store, playing time on iOS went down 56 minutes per week, but only rose nine minutes per week on other platforms. He says this indicates people found it too hard to switch to another platform. Evans also tried to make an argument for an aftermarket monopoly on in-app payments. That argument relies on a Supreme Court decision that found Kodak was acting as a monopoly in the aftermarket by refusing to sell parts directly to independent service organizations. That decision is generally construed very narrowly and awfully often involves changes of policy. We're not talking about any changes of policy. It's not like Apple gets you it as a customer and then ups the price of the app store. Uh, so Epic is trying to define iOS users as a market because it's hard for them to switch and therefore Apple is monopolizing the distribution of apps to them, and then also making an even harder market that its aftermarket policy is limited to in-app payments and, and is a monopoly itself. In cross-examination, Apple got Evans to admit that Apple does not have a monopoly in the phone business, because it only has 47% of the U.S. market share. Apple also challenged Evans' assertion that buying a game on a non-iPhone platform is not a substitution for buying it on the iPhone. They're like, if you get Fortnite on Android, that's a substitution, right? Mm -hmm. Apple argues that players often play games on multiple platforms. They're not locked into playing just on iOS, and people do that. iOS is just one of the ways you can play Fortnite. Apple also argued there is robust competition in games outside of iOS. Judge Gonzalez Rogers, though, is where this all comes down to. Remember, this is a bench trial, so you got to convince the judge Judge Gonzalez Rogers challenged Evans on treating in-app purchases as a separate aftermarket from app distribution. Again, that's construed very narrowly, so it didn't sound like that was convincing her. The judge pointed out that Fortnite's in-game currency could be bought on the web and used in the iOS app. She's like, how is that a, a monopoly if you can just go to your browser and buy it? However, she did indicate she may have issue with Apple prohibiting developers from telling users they could go to the web to get them. So that's something to watch. She may, depending on how she writes the decision, uh, she might 
you know, rap Apple on, on the knuckles for prohibiting you from even telling you to go there. Uh, this this is where we're at. This is the state of the Apple Epic. Uh, you know, we've got we've got more witnesses. This is going to last into the next week, but that's where we are so far with that argument. The big uh, the big thing that we uh, didn't get to here is uh, the conversation they're having about other consoles and the argument that Apple is making that how is this any different than consoles, PlayStation, Xbox, and anyone else where you have a relatively closed system and it's not easy to switch to somebody else. And that's true in all the same ways. Uh, at least that's Apple's argument. And I think I agree with it. It's getting really interesting. Like people really want to laugh and scoff at this trial and laugh that they have to talk about individual gamey things and that banana, stupid banana costume came up in arguments and all this <laughs> stuff. It's all kind of a riot, but at the end of the day, it's there's really interesting precedent stuff being talked about. And I think if you look at it from the broad sense and uh, really pay attention to what's going on, it's fascinating. And I'm no lawyer, but I am enjoying this back and forth. And I hope others are. Yeah. It's, it's all going to come down whether the judge thinks... Yeah, it costs a lot of money to, to get a new phone, and it's a pain to move all your data over, uh, and all your apps may not be there. Yeah, that that's enough lock-in. Or if the judge says, well, you know, it, it may not be super easy, but you can do it, and yeah. therefore right. you're not locked in. Fascinating. Yeah. Um, let's jump over to the UK. They introduced an online safety bill, which would place a duty of care on social media companies to quickly remove illegal content and some abuse that is not criminal, Sites must also limit the spread of terrorist material, suicide uh, content, and child sex, sexual abuse, and report such content to authorities. If a company does not meet its day, uh, duty of care, UK regulator Ofcom can fine companies up to 10% of turnover or 18 million pounds. Uh, let's see. Order access to uh, sorry, order access to sites to be blocked and pursue criminal action against the senior managers involved. That one made a lot of eyebrows raise. The bill also requires companies to protect small, or excuse me, protect overall freedom of expression and reinstate unfairly removed material. It forbids discrimination against political viewpoints and prohibits the arbitrary removal of journalistic content. Yeah, so yeah. this is uh, a, a UK uh, bill. It's not finalized yet, but uh, so a lot of the devil's in the details here. Like, Ofcom gets a lot of power. In, in this and and what are the checks on that power? How do they determine uh, when a company hasn't met its duty of care? Because those are big fines and criminal action against senior managers is is a big stick to be able to wield. Yeah, I should this go forward um, and get uh, defined a little bit uh, <laughs> a little bit more, particularly when it comes to that senior management thing. My eyebrows were definitely raised, Scott, when I read that because I was, you know, you, you you see this all the time, not just in the UK, of course, but large companies who say, all right, well, you know, we're trying really hard. Nobody, we don't want uh, terrorist material on our platform, but, you know, it's a game of whack-a-mole and who's at fault. And, and this is a very much an ongoing discussion. And depending on who you talk to, the answer is different. But once you get people at the top of this very successful social network say I'm not naming any names but 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 you 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 can uh, you can connect the dots uh, being in you know potential cr criminal liability territory and again like you said Tom this is a bill there's a lot more that has to happen before any any of this becomes becomes law that is very interesting because it's it's less of a well, we're trying our best and more of a, oh, no, we actually need to do things very differently. Yeah. I wonder if uh, if they, if at the end of the day, this all comes down to uh, the winner being the companies who figured out the fastest way to get rid of stuff the UK won't don't doesn't want you to have on there. In other words, like speed is the kicker here. It's all about who can speed run this process and eliminate this particular content faster than the other guy. Because then there's your standard, right? And everyone else is going to have to catch up to that, which is a weird standard. So I'm real torn on that, but I'm also kind of fascinated by that. Like, whose tools are, are going to be better is kind of what's going to determine who's the most compliant. I, I'm really curious to see how they define certain elements like terrorist material. What is terrorist material and how do you define that when you also have uh, things that, you know, would like to protect overall freedom of expression? If showing support for a particular cause although it might be aligned with a group that might be considered a terrorist group, 
you run into a lot of gray areas and they're it, this kind of reminds me of what Justin used to say about uh, 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 policing a lot of this stuff is that it's your hell portal, right? It's you're going to get into a lot of the you're going to get into the weeds with a lot of this stuff if you don't want to quote uh, have arbitrary removal of journalistic content. If someone says like to be a journalist, do you need to be accredited with an actual like newspaper or news organization, or can you just get by with being a blogger who reports on stuff they see? I I don't know. It feels feels like there needs to be, uh, I, as the process uh, goes on, it needs to be a little more defined with some of the... Uh, well, it may be defined. Have you read yeah. the bill? Because I haven't. No. So I, I don't want to say it should be more defined if the but. bill actually has it defined. But uh, your, your point is right. It, it, the devil is in the details of how it is defined. Uh, there are plenty of precedents for calling it ter for, for terrorist material that haven't caused problems. So if they're following that to say like, oh, in the past, this has been called terrorist material, we're going to follow that definition, great. If it's got a more vague definition, then your concern is absolutely valid. Uh, same with journalism. There, there are some precedents for, for how to define journalism. Are they following those? Uh, and even, but, but even then, the duty of care definition is this is the really important one here. How do you, how do you define who has to meet it so that you're not keeping smaller businesses out because they can't afford to do it, uh, and and what is the definition of having responded quickly enough? Those those are the important questions to ask when you read that bill. Scientists at Singapore's Nanyang Technological University, or NTU, have successfully controlled a Venus flytrap using electric signals from a smartphone. This could introduce a range of uses from robotics to employing the plants as environmental sensors. The NTU's School of Material Science and Engineering researcher, Luo Yifei, demonstrated how sending a signal from an app to tiny electrodes that are attached to the plant could make its trap close, like it does when it catches as a fly, and also without damaging the plant. The researchers also detached the trap portion of the Venus flytrap and attached it to a robotic arm so that a signal could tell it to grip something very thin and fragile, like a piece of wire. The hope is that plants, as living sensors, could help monitor environmental pollution from gas or water and also act like soft robots. Yeah, the soft robot part of this really caught my eye. Uh, being able to use that material, that sensor. I don't know if you'd have to keep growing Vetus flytraps to provide it, but uh, the idea of soft robots is they're able to do things that metal you know, servos can't because because they're softer, they're gentler, they don't damage the, the people who work with them. Uh, and, a, and a Venus flytrap being able to move threads, that could provide a lot of, of sensitive, manipulative ability to robots that a lot of robots don't have right now. That's a massive, uh, a massive potential cool thing when it comes to prosthetics, for example. You know, how much pressure somebody puts on a prosthetic arm and prosthetic fingers, having that gentler take rather than the big like you said servo <laughs> big awkward robot take that most of robotics seems to be stuck with right now this is a much cooler more granular approach to movement and i hope it translates to some of that as well that would be really cool it could also be the beginning of uh what's that musical you know where the venus oh. flytrap eats people uh, I mean, it's just uh, be careful yeah Steve uh, Martin and Martin Short. I can't remember the Rick, name of the movie. Rick, Rick Moranis was in it. A little Rick shop Moranis. of horrors. Little shop Thank of horrors. Little shop of horrors. <laughs> yeah, we, you, got there. we got there. We got there. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. We got a nice email from Scott who wrote in. It wasn't you, Scott Johnson. No, Different no, Scott. Yeah, <laughs> just in case you thought maybe you had amnesia. Different yeah. Scott. Scott says, between the possibility of the next Apple Watch having a glucose monitor to the coverage of Bigfoot's connected insulin pens, y'all did a great job explaining and understanding them, especially understanding the lifting of the management burden with Bigfoot. That's a real tangible relief. Thank you so much, Scott. Scott goes on to say, come October, I'll have lived with type one diabetes for 40 years and in my time seeing t1d tech covered rarely is it understood or explained well by those outside the community scott also says as a side note yes sarah's smart lights are still just as valid after the bigfoot announcement as they were before we can all get along no problem yes you, you were saying my lights don't seem that important in light of this uh but but uh, scott says no your your lights are still important but thank you scott and uh, a higher compliment i cannot imagine being paid uh from someone within a community uh saying that that you know because we work hard to try to get this stuff right to, to saying we did it this time so thank you scott i really appreciate that 
Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, love the feedback. Love all of your feedback. You got questions, you got comments, you can send all of that to us. We read it all. We promise. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Also, shout out to patrons at our master and our grandmaster levels. Today, they include Dustin Campbell, Alexander Nasev, and Johnny Hernandez. We'd also like to give a very special Wednesday thank you to Martin James, who's one of our top lifetime supporters for DTNS. Martin, you're the best. Thank you for all the years of support. Also, thanks to Scott Johnson for being with us today. Scott, what have you been up to since we saw you last? Well, busy trying to fulfill that Kickstarter you guys helped me get, and uh, big thanks to your audience once again. But um, to keep up with that and everything else I have going on right now, a great place to do it is the newsletter. Go follow me or go follow it and get signed up for it at frogpants.club. And uh, there's cool stuff every week. You get comics and art and shows and information and weird stuff about my own personal life. Uh, so go check it out. Feel free to reply to that stuff. Send me your emails back. Let me know what you think. Again, that is frogpants.club. And thanks for having me on as always. Of course. Speaking of being on, we're live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 2030 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. And we'll be back here again doing it all tomorrow with Justin Robert Young. Talk to you then. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>